this uh, presentation this evening, which I will make available on our blog uh, and potentially our website, which is a little more problematic, but I'll tell you where you can see this later on if you'd like. So that being said, let's get started with this a little bit and uh, let's talk a little bit real quickly about who I am. Uh, some of you I recognize the names, have been to some of my lectures, but many of you probably don't know anything about me. I was a full-time practicing dentist for over 19 years as a GP. I decided to go back to school and become an orthodontist, and currently I'm a full-time uh, orthodontic resident at age 45 at Nova Southeastern University down in uh, South Florida. So if anybody's ever down here, feel free to look me up. Uh, I did, when I first bought my practice 16 years ago, I took a six-day-a-week insurance-driven practice um, and turned it into a three-and-a-half-day-a-week practice with the same revenue in less than four years. And I did that with a lot of the techniques that I'm going to teach as we go through these processes. Now, we're starting with cameras, but as time goes on, I'm going to create more webinars to sort of give you the secrets that I used as I started going through my practice to, high, to try to grow it. Now, I've worked in the high-volume insurance-based practices. I've worked in a low-volume boutique practice where I'd see maybe one patient a day sometimes. And so these techniques that we talk about as we move forward in other webinars are applicable to almost anything. But more importantly, I want to work smarter. I don't want to work harder. I want to take home more. I want to spend time doing the things I love outside of dentistry. So we'll talk more about those. But if you look at the image that's in front of you right now, this is where it starts. Uh, I'm all about photography because it's the best tool we have to be able to relate things to our patients. And if your images look like the ones you see on the screen right now, kudos to you because you know it takes practice and you know it takes a little bit of know-how to get yourself into a position where you can take images that look the way these look. Sometimes going through uh, the web, colors can look a little bit weird, things can change. But for the most part, I really want you to look at composition. I want you to notice what these teeth look like. And uh, we will get to the black background in one of my future webinars to talk a little bit about how we do that. But I want you to get focused, no pun intended, on the composition, on what the images look like. Look at the lighting. Look at the composition in terms of the dryness. Look at the things that are out of the way. All your singers' teeth, you're not seeing lips, you're not seeing noses, you're not seeing retractors, and that's what's the important part. So if you're like most people who see these things, it's sort of, well, how do I get there? Well, let's talk about it a little bit. So there's going to be eight tips tonight, and that's why I called it the eight tips to implementing this in your practice or buying the right camera system. So tip number one is to develop a game plan. Now, I know it looks kind of funny to see your chalk drawing from football, but there's a whole method to this, and it's got to start with a game plan. So ask yourself, how do you plan to use the camera? Uh, when are you going to use it? Is it important to you to use it on every patient? Or are you going to use it on some people? But it's important to think a little bit about how you're going to use it. Is it going to be used for marketing? Is it going to be used for new patient appointments? Is it going to be used for diagnosis? Are you planning on ever teaching? I will say as a side note, if you ever do want to teach or lecture, putting your, your pictures up on a big screen is a good way to increase your quality of your own care. When you start taking pictures, you start looking at things a lot more carefully, and suddenly the way you treat gets a lot better. Then you start teaching, and you put it on an 8 by 10 screen, and suddenly you see your real flaws pop up. So don't be afraid of that, but ask yourself, how do you plan to use this camera? Who's going to shoot the images? Is it going to be you? Is it going to be one of your assistants? As I found out, being an orthodontic resident now, I've realized that in ortho practices, it's impossible for the, general, or the, the dentist to shoot all the images. It's generally the assistant. And I have absolutely nothing against the assistant shooting the images in any office. I used to be dead set against it. I felt that the doctor had to be the master of all techniques. However, in your practice, if you have the assistant shoot the images, that's fine as long as they're getting good images. But think these things out. Make sure there's a plan for this. Who's going to upload the images? Again, it's important. There's a workflow to this. It just doesn't magically happen where you shoot images and they appear on a screen. Somebody's got to edit the images, right? Even if you shoot gorgeous images, somebody, somebody has to have the ability to take a mirror image and flip it because it'll be backwards. Where are you going to keep them? What computer are they going to be on? Are they going to be on your server? Do you have a consult room? Is it going to be on your consult room com computer? These are the things that are important. I kept mine in my consult room computer, and I had my IT person create a shortcut on all of the desktops and all of the office so that I could view my images from anywhere. Now, we'll talk more about this at a future webinar, but I am not a fan at all of keeping images in, in your proprietary software like Dentrix or PracticeWorks or any of those. I don't care what they tell you. 
But once you start putting them in there, getting them out in batches is impossible, especially if you want to assign them to particular people. So now you're dependent on that computer company, and I'm a fan of independence. So again, think about these things about where you're going to keep them. I'm always available to you if you have questions. Email me. You'll get my email address at the end, and I'll always be happy to help you out. How are you going to back them up? Off-site? I certainly suggest it. Are you going to take home hard drives? I certainly suggest it. So again, where are you going to back them up? Make a plan for this and implement it appropriately. When are you going to show them? I know it sounds like a stupid question because it's going to be like, well, I'm going to show them to the patient at the consultation. Well, give some thought to that. There's a lot of times you can use this for marketing, and we're going to talk more about that again at a future webinar. I know your time's important. That's why I try to keep these to 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, I can keep your attention for that long, and we can go on to bigger things at later dates if you're interested. So make a plan in writing for these things. This doesn't happen by accident. When you implement it successfully, it happens because there was a plan that you thought out. So tip number two, you got to get your team on board. I thought this picture was a really good way of illustrating teamwork. Uh, I like the way he sits on one kid's back and then the other one sits on his back. That's teamwork. And you need that kind of dedication from your team. So you, first thing you're going to have to do is explain to your team why you're doing this. Why are you suddenly changing things? Because if you don't explain it to them, it's going to be sitting in a closet, your camera will, next to the gold foil condensing equipment in a few days. The goal of the office staff is to keep things running as smoothly as they can. And if they sense that there's going to be turbulence, just because of them being human beings, they're going to want to gravitate away from this stuff. So explain to them that you can change your practice into the one you've always dreamt of it being by getting great images and having patients become partners in their care and asking less questions of the front desk staff about why they're doing certain things and what's the necessity of certain things and making your day go quicker. But it's going to take work. Again, if you haven't noticed it yet, I'm really into the written plan. Create it with their input. It's, it's very important that your team members be a part of this process because if you try to implement it without them, you're sure to fail. You need to be clear on who will be responsible for each step in the process. Again, don't put it all on Susie. Okay, if Susie's the one in the office who's your right hand and she has to do everything, well, there's going to be a sense of entitlement and everybody else is going to take advantage of that just again because we're humans. But the most important thing in all of this is do not, under any circumstances, and I apologize to the people out there who are team members, but please understand where I'm coming from. Do not give in to your team members' fears or problems because the first thing they're going to say to you is, well, uh, this camera's really heavy, or, you know, we're going to have to get it out of the middle section, or our day is going to slow down. With all due respect, that's not your problem. Your problem is getting your patients to be your partners, to sell more care, to do it in a less stressful environment, to make more money, working less hours, doing the best quality care you can. And a camera and implementing it successfully is the key to this. And you're going to find a lot of people who are in your staff who might potentially give you resistance. Don't let that stop you. Make it clear to them that their problems are their problems, and if they open up their mind, they'll be fine. There's an old saying by Henry Ford, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're usually right. And if you tell them that you can do this, you're going to do this. So again, don't give in to that. Tip number three is don't be afraid of the SLR. Now, for many of you out there, you probably have a point-and-shoot camera. This in front of you right now is an SLR, which means single lens reflex. You'll notice that the lens on the front can usually be taken off and put on. It doesn't matter the model. There's a fundamental difference between a single lens reflex and a point-and-shoot. Point-and-shoots are smaller. Remember tip number two, don't give in to their fear. Every team member on earth before learning how to use a camera wants a point and shoot. Virtually every dentist on earth wants a point and shoot. But when people would come to my two-day course when I lived in Seattle, and I would show them how to use these cameras, once somebody started using an SLR, they never, ever went back to a point and shoot. Why? Well, they allow far more control and way better images. Now, if it comes down to you making the ultimatum, you know what? I'm not going to shoot anything unless I can shoot a point and shoot then fine, shoot a point and shoot. But I'm telling you now, if you're going to invest the money, invest it in an SLR. Yes, they're bigger. Yes, they're heavier. But the quality you're going to get from it is immeasurably better. They're bigger and they do cost more, but please don't be intimidated. If you ever have questions, go to my blog, which I'll give you the address, or email me. But I'm always here to help you. I have nothing to sell you here in terms of cameras. So go with an SLR. I promise you, once you learn how to use it, 
Uh, you'll, you'll have a, an amazing time with it. And once you set it up, it's essentially a point and shoot at that point. You just have to learn the settings, and we're going to talk about that at the next webinar. Again, here's a theme. Make a plan in writing. A big mistake that a lot of people who buy cameras is that they buy something with lots of bells and whistles. We're dentists, we're dental assistants, we're administrative teams. We love bells and whistles. If there's something really cool about the camera, let's get it. Well, the truth of the matter is you don't need it. Get a camera that makes sense for your practice, which in my case, and you'll see me say it in a moment, is getting the most camera for the least amount of money. Don't dream of uses that you'll never implement. When I give my courses, I have people come up to me and give me the most bizarre uses. Hey, Doc, I think I'm going to take my camera and I'm going to shoot images and I'm going to beam them to my consult room where Susie's going to automatically, I, I, I just say, stop, stop. The surest way to fail is to make this complicated. This is the easiest thing on earth. It's easier than doing a class one composite. Make it simple. Don't think of the six shots per second being at all important. Don't worry about how many megapixels the camera shoots. If you've bought a camera in the last eight to 10 years, you have more than enough megapixels to fill a screen beautifully. So don't go ahead and just buy a new camera for the sake of buying a new camera. I'm really into trying to save money wherever possible. Get the features you really need. For instance, if your eyesight is getting older, it, it, as you get older, if your eyesight is starting to get worse, maybe you want one with a bigger screen. I love the bigger screen, works like a charm. Maybe lighter is better for you. Maybe you wanna get a camera that's a little on the smaller side. Okay, so it all depends upon what's important to you, but get the features that you really need and nothing more. Again, like I said, get the least amount of camera that still fits your needs. Yeah, there's many cameras out there. Now, for instance, a lot of people ask me, can I get the Nikon 3100? The 3100 is an entry-level camera. It's, too, it's got features on it that you can't use for an industrial use. So that is too little camera. But if you went up to the next step after that, which was the D90, that's an amazing camera. And you don't need to move up the line to a $2,000 camera body. It's a waste of money. Another thing that I see a lot of dentists and, and hygienists and front desk um, do that is a mistake is they buy a camera and they mix and match components. What I mean by that is don't buy the lens from one person and the flash from another and the camera body from a third. I see Frankenstein setups from people, and I look at it and say, where'd you get that from? Oh, I bought it from some dental company. Do yourself a favor and buy the whole setup from the same manufacturer. It's important. If you remember the good old days when you first started with computers and a computer started to have a problem, the hardware manufacturer, let's call it IBM, would blame it on Microsoft's software. Microsoft, you'd call their customer service and they'd blame it on the hardware of the computer. In the end, you wasted a ton of time and a ton of your money trying to figure out whose fault it was before you even got a, sol a solved problem. If you buy the lens, the camera, and the flash from the same manufacturer, not the same company, but the same manufacturer, right? You can go to B&H Photo and buy three separate companies. You want to buy the same manufacturer. So if you buy a Nikon camera with a Nikon flash and a Nikon lens and something goes wrong, you send it to Nikon and say, this is your problem, fix it. But if you get a Tamron lens and a Metz flash and a Nikon body, who's going to pick up the responsibility on this? Do yourself the favor. We're dentists with expensive offices. I know we have high overhead, but spend a little bit more money. And when I say a little bit more, I mean a few hundred dollars and get everything from the same manufacturer. Trust me when I tell you the money you save by buying a less expensive lens for a couple of hundred bucks will not be worth it in the long run. Not to mention that any good photographer worth their salt is never going to change glass, meaning they're going to put a Canon lens on a Canon body every time. Think through this entire setup before you choose a brand of camera. There's a lot you need to know. Wait until after our second webinar where I really get into settings and how to use your camera system more efficiently. Once I do that, it'll make a very, very big difference for you in terms of helping you better understand what you need to buy because frankly right now you really don't know and I'll help you get there. So that said, tip number six which follows hand in hand is buy from an authorized dealer. All too often people go on eBay, they find themselves somebody to buy a whole setup from, they're not an authorized dealer and they get themselves into trouble. You got to check up on the credentials of the seller. There's a lot of stuff you, you don't know what you don't know. So you have to ask them specifically, are you a Nikon or, or are you a Canon authorized dealer? I throw out Canon and Nikon because they make up the majority of the market share today in dentistry. 
when I go lecture to a group of, say, 100 dentists and there's 100 cameras, I'd say probably other than Canon and Nikon, you might find one in the room that's a different brand and mostly because it's 10 to 12 years old. Uh, go back to the old Fuji days. But generally, most people in the last five to seven years are buying Nikons or Canons. But you've got to ask, are they authorized? It's super important because if they're not authorized, you may be buying actual Nikon goods that were meant to be sold in another country. And what you're getting is what they call gray market goods. Your Nikon USA warranty is void the moment you purchase that equipment from a non-authorized salesperson. So you can go get yourself a deal and save $150 on the web from a non-authorized dealer. Something breaks uh, two months into it, and in the end, you're stuck with a, something that you can no longer use, and it's broken, and you have to pay for it to be fixed. So again, do yourself a favor and always buy from an authorized dealer. Ask them, what are the details of your warranty? If they say, oh, you've got a warranty, many people find out later that the warranty is actually a company warranty, not a Nikon or a Canon warranty. And as far as I'm concerned, it's worth uh, less than the paper it's printed on. So find out these sorts of things. Do they have a loaner program? I, I believe that dental companies like Lester Dine or Photomed have loaner programs, which means if you have a camera that you buy from them and it breaks, you call them, they'll send you a camera to use while yours is being repaired. You're, you're probably not going to find that from most non-dental companies. So it depends. Is it worth it to you? You're probably going to pay more for it. But if you're using your camera on a regular basis, which 89% of you in this, in this webinar right now have told me that you're using your camera at least once a week, a loaner may be an important thing for you. And as I said, amazing deals are often too good to be true. So if you can find yourself a $1,000 camera that's selling for 350 bucks, I'm willing to bet you right now that there's a major problem what's going on. So two more tips left, and then we'll go to questions. I want you to be prepared for the learning curve. Okay, as you see from this, you know, there's a slow beginning, a steep acceleration, and then a plateau that you slowly get better. Things take time. Imagine that I, I, I gave you a one-on-one -on -one clinic with Michael Jordan to learn how to play basketball. You had one hour with him. He taught you every trick in the book. You couldn't just go out to a, a court and, and slam dunk and beat everybody. It takes time to practice. And this does take time. Don't get frustrated. Practice, practice, practice. If you have regular team meetings, maybe you devote one team meeting to taking pictures and you put somebody in the chair and just shoot images. You're going to have to practice this. The first dozen or so sets aren't going to look so good. Don't get depressed. Nothing looks great the first time through. And now that I'm back in school uh, in residency and I'm watching all the undergraduate dental students, you know, I'm not going to say anything to them, but it's kind of amazing how bad your stuff looks when you first get started. And over time, you get better and better because you practice it. Here's a biggie. Book one hour for every one of your images, patients, for the first dozen. I know it sounds crazy. How can I afford to give up 12 hours in my schedule? I would argue, how can you afford not to? You need to get great at this. Give yourself time so you don't get rushed. Even if the first 10 go perfectly and you're done in 20 minutes, don't book number 11 at 20 minutes because you're going to get snake bit. And when you do, you're going to get frustrated. Your staff is going to go, told you so, and the camera's gone. And I'm telling you now, I've worked with thousands of dentists over the years. You use pictures regularly the way I teach you, and you do case presentation the way we talk about at future webinars, you will watch your case acceptance go through the ceiling. Just keep at it and don't give up. That's the key here. And tip number eight, a little self-serving on my behalf, but it's, it has to be said at some point. You need to get trained at this stuff. You got to treat this like any other clinical procedure. You can't just go pick up a handpiece, put a burr in it of any particular type, and go set yourself forth on some teeth and start drilling. You have to learn the basics. If you don't know how to do this stuff properly, if you don't know how to set your camera up, if you don't know how to put mirrors and retractors in properly, it's going to be very, very frustrating for you. And the learning curve that I showed you earlier is going to take much longer. Eventually, you figure out where you need to be and you get trained at that point if you're having a frustrating time. But the key is get started first. Now, again, here's the self-serving part. About five years ago, I made a DVD that showed how to compose images. It was me for 45 minutes being followed around cl the clinic, basically, 
by a professional camera crew. This isn't some hum, homegrown video that shows you how to put mirrors in, how to put retractors in, how to get the shots the way you saw them at the beginning of this webinar. Because it's really easy if you know how to do it. But if you don't, it's not something that comes intuitive. I made a 40-minute video that's great for doctors, for team members. It's a great refresher. I've never had anybody use it who didn't say they didn't get much, much better immediately. I also have a second one that I just created that walks people through the basics of buying a lens, of buying a flash, of buying a camera. What's the differences in them? How do you use a histogram for perfect lighting every time? Uh, things like that. How do you set it up? Again, if you want images that look like this on a regular basis, it's not going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen without practice. And it's not going to happen without team support. But look at any one of these four images and think about what the possibility is for, ma for marketing, for teaching, for lecturing. These are the sorts of things that allow informed consent to patients in a way that you'd never be able to. And if you look at the picture on the lower left hand with the broken incisor piece that I put back on temporarily, this is a great documentation tool, but it doesn't happen by accident. So again, training tools, real quickly, the first DVD you see here, the yellow one, is my exquisite dental photography made easy, entirely devoted to composition. Don't buy this if you're looking to how to buy a camera or how to set up a camera. But if you own a camera um, and you already know what you need to know about histograms and f-stops and depth of field, uh, then this is the one for you. It's the only DVD of its kind in the world. Nobody else shows you the kind of shots I'm showing you. And it's been in about 15 countries already since five years ago when I first released it. No matter what camera you own, whether it's a point and shoot or an SLR, the techniques I show in this, on this particular DVD are applicable to every camera out there. It's just about mirrors and retractors and why you need to shoot the way you need to shoot and how to do it. The new one, which should be available in the next three to four weeks, but uh, I let people order it now and you'll be the first ones in the world to get it. It's been uh, reviewed by a number of people who love it. Uh, it took me a year and a half to put this together called Getting Started with Clinical Photography. It's the detailed information about how to buy a lens, a flash, and a camera. How to set the camera up. What is an ISO setting? What is an f-stop? What setting should I put it on for my, for my pictures, large, medium, or fine, JPEG, or TIFF, and why? How do you get great lighting, right? Not too light and not too dark. Uh, how do I get great depth of field so that when I focus on the centrals, I get the second molars as well? These are things that I used to travel around the country teaching that I can't do anymore because I'm in school. So I tried to give you the next best thing. These two DVDs together probably will answer 95% of any questions you'll ever have. And if you practice them, you'll have spectacular images. If you visit us at, at my website at creekercontinuum.com in the next 48 hours and use that code WEB113, you'll get 10% off anything you order. You can see on the bottom of the picture, I've specially designed retractors and mirrors that are totally different than what's out there. I designed them myself after teaching and watching people struggle with the mirrors that don't go back far enough or are too short so you, you, you're looking at your thumb in the picture uh, or why you can't get somebody open wide enough for a maxillary occlusal shot. On the yellow DVD, it shows you all of that. But again, I have reasons for doing these things the way I do them because having taught for 10 years, this is what I've learned. You can always email me at glenn at creekercontinuum.com. I would, I would suggest you go also to my blog, which is dentalphotography.blogspot.com, where you have the opportunity to go through the archives. And for instance, I, have a, I found an 18-inch ring flash for less than $200 from China that will give you the most gorgeous portrait shots you could ever imagine without any other things you have to learn. You turn it on, you put the patient in front of it, and you shoot through it. That's on my blog. Uh, if I find anything new or cool, I'm going to throw it up there so you can see about it. On my website, uh, the two DVDs, for at least for right now, because it's a new DVD and I want to introduce it, I've combined them together to where there's a huge discount, even before the 10%, if you buy both of them at once. And I promise it'll be money well spent. I stand behind everything I sell, and uh, knock on wood, I haven't had anybody, well, I, I'm, I'm sorry, in five years I've had one DVD returned, so I'll be honest with you, but I stand behind everything I do. The second webinar is going to be next Wednesday at 7.30, same time, how to use your clinical, uh, clinic dental camera system for maximum efficiency. We're going to cover a lot of topics in that that sort of dovetail with what we're doing here. Um, for instance, how to set up the camera in some very general broad terms because I just don't have time to go through that. Uh, when should you use your camera? When shouldn't you? For sure not to. 
Um, how do you get your team on board? Uh, when do you use this and how do you use this with new patients? Uh, how and when to properly transfer images because there's some mistakes that people make with that. You know, a biggie is how do we re-enroll our existing patients? Because now you're shooting beautiful images. You have all these patients you've been watching for ages. How do I re-enroll them? So things like this we're going to talk about uh, next week. So with that, I want to allow some time for questions. I encourage you all to stay around because often the questions that one person is asking uh, is the same question that somebody else would. I hope the technology is working. Uh, I hope on your uh, screen on the right you should see a little box that says questions that you should click down and, and ask questions of. Um, I don't see any up there yet, but please, if you can come up with one, uh, please send me a question. Uh, and of course, send me an email at my, my, um, my email address, glenn, G-L-E-N-N, at kriegercontinuum.com. That's K-R-I-E-G-E-R. C-O-N as in Nancy, T-I-N as in Nancy, U-U-M as in Mary, dot com. Send me any questions you have if you don't have anything come through. Again, I'm not seeing any questions yet, um, which may be leading me to believe that you might be having some issues here. Um, if you can't, if there's a chat feature up there, you might want to try it through your chat feature. Or everybody here just knows everything, and we don't have any questions. Anybody? I don't see anything yet. Uh, Sarah, my coordinator, is here on the line, and I'm going to ask Sarah to tell me through my earpiece if she sees any questions yet. Yes, all of a sudden they popped up, so thank you. So Dr. Campbell uh, seems to be asking a question. If you have a point-and-shoot hanging around, can it be used for portraits? Of course. That's an amazing question. Uh, if you have a point-and-shoot, you can use it for portraits. Uh, you can use it for intraoral as well if you don't have anything else. But I would caution you about using two different cameras if you're using an SLR for in-the-mouth shooting because the portrait shots are the easiest ones to get with an SLR. They're simple. They're quick. So I would tell you just to shoot the point-and-shoot um, for other things, like maybe patient photos for a chart. Uh, if you, For instance, if you have Dentrix, I don't know about practice works, but if you want to put a picture for a patient on their digital chart, point-and-shoots are amazing for that because oftentimes you can link them with a cord into your camera system and use it just like that. But if you're going to shoot point and shoot, if you're going to shoot portraits and you have an SLR, use your SLR for the point and shoot. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, uh, Dr. Pearson, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, I love doing this and thank you for the compliment. Uh, Dr. Liu, I have a Fuji 3 with a Nikon macro lens and ring flash. Would you replace it? Well, if it's working for you and you like it, I would not replace it. I think it's a great camera. Uh, the best camera is the one you use. And if you can see things and it's working well, don't look for a reason to go spend more money. I would sooner tell you, if you're gonna spend money, and again, shameless plug, consider the DVD. It'll go a lot further than a new camera if your camera is working properly. As long as your camera can adjust f-stops, which I believe the Fuji 3 certainly can, and you have a uh, Nikon macro lens and a, and a ring flash, you shouldn't have any trouble. The only thing you're going to give up is the size of the screen. And I would tell you, if it has a tiny little screen that you're struggling with, see what you can do about changing the camera body. And if you're not sure, if your camera body fits with your flash or your lens, your local camera store can tell you, or you can email me, and I'm happy to help. So I hope that helps you out. Um, Dr. Nunez uh, asks, can I link the pictures with Eaglesoft? Meaning, uh, when you take pictures... Can you uh, put them in EagleSoft? You could, but I would strongly suggest against it. These things are like roach motels. Your images check in, but they don't check out. Um, it's, I don't care what any of them tell you. As of, say, a month and a half ago, as far as I knew, there was no program on Earth, dental program, that allowed you to upload all your images to patient charts, and then if you decided to change systems, you could move them out according to patient name seamlessly into another program. So I'll talk about it at a future webinar, but I'm a big fan of using inter uh, Windows Explorer. Windows Explorer comes free on your computers. It's a database management system. It's meant to do this. You can put a, a shortcut on every one of your um, computers in all your rooms, and whenever you upgrade your computers, you, it goes right with you. No matter what software you're using, it works. Uh, it's a beautiful way to go, and it's free. My favorite. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, Dr. Liu has another question. Would I use a 100-millimeter macro lens or a 50-millimeter for portraits? Um, 
it's a very good question. Whatever you're using in the mouth is what I'd use outside the mouth. My favorite lens on earth is the Nikon 85 miller millimeter micro lens. They call it micro, it means macro, but the 85 millimeter is an amazing lens. Works absolutely beautifully. Um, light, much lighter than the 105. Um, it's way less expensive than a 105. Uh, your team won't fight with you as much, uh, and it just works absolutely beautifully. So I would strongly recommend, um, if you're a Canon, I would stick with the 100. I think the 50 uh, is a little bit too small of a, a lens to really consider using for that. But there are 200s that, Nike, that Canon makes. One is obscenely expensive. Don't use that one. It's not worth it. You don't want to uh, spend that point, that, that money on that. Um, I have another question from, uh, looks like Dr. Campbell. Is the new multi-point focus system on the new Nikon D7100 going to mean faster focusing in the mouth? It, it very well might, but I got to be honest, I don't need faster focusing. If your mirrors and retractors are being used properly, your camera should focus really quickly, unless it's a really old camera, or it could be your lens. If you have a Nikon late model camera within the last five years and a Nikon uh, late model lens, uh, the two should link together. You should be focusing in a second, maybe less. If you're not, there may be a problem with the focusing system on your camera. You may want to get it checked out. But uh, it may be. I don't know about future technology. I get a chance to see it when you do. Just because dentistry is small, I don't get access to, they don't give me access to anything new. But I would tell you, don't wait for a camera for that reason. Uh, the D90, which has been out for years, is an amazing camera. It focuses way faster than anybody should need. And I would argue that if you're having trouble out there, anybody with autofocus, not focusing quickly enough, I'm willing to bet you it's a mirrors and retractors issue because you don't have enough stuff out of the way so your focusing system is focusing on too broad of an area and it's getting the lip and the mirror and the retractor and it just doesn't know what to focus on. So um, that would be my answer for you. Um, so Dr. I, I'm sorry if I screw up your name, Dr. Dome, I think it is, uh, asks, when discussing focal length, we need to know if you're working with a full frame sensor or not. Generally speaking, most dental cameras are not working with full frame sensors. That's an amazing question from a guy uh, who, it says, I see your first name, so I know you're a guy. It comes from a guy who's a photography guy. He likes photography. He likes the details, and I respect that. It's a great question. I would say for most of the people in this room, it's not something that's going to apply to them, but we're not zooming in real close. Like, for instance, full-frame sensors versus, say, 90% sensors makes a big difference when you have a telephoto lens or a zoom lens, and you're zooming in on something from a 100 yards away, and you're narrowing the field, and your sensor is going to narrow it even more. That's not the case here. We don't really need to worry about that because our lenses allow us to get everything we need to see without a problem. So don't worry about the full-frame sensor thing or not. It's not going to be an issue. It shouldn't play a role with what you're doing on a regular basis. Um, it's a great question, and uh, sitting down over a beer, it's one that we could have a lot of fun with. Uh, but I'll tell you now, I'm not worried about it for dentistry. When we talk about focal length, we're talking about focal length from the lens as it comes out of the manufacturer. So a 100 millimeter lens from Canon is what we're talking about here. And I hope that answers your question. Um, I don't want to keep you guys any longer. My email address is always available to you. Again, please go to my website uh, and check out my, um, please check out my um, blog, my website. Uh, it's always there to help you out. And again, if you use the code WEB113 within the next 48 hours to purchase the DVD, uh, I promise you, you will be uh, very, very happy with what you get. Uh, we've sold many, many of them, and they've changed a ton of practices. So with that, I want to thank you for your time. Hopefully, I'll see you next Wednesday evening. If you like this, tell your friends. Uh, we can hold up to 100, and we had 83 registrants this time. So take care, and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful evening.